Welcome back to the Balanced Blonde Podcast, Soul on Fire. Today, I was thinking it would be fun to start the podcast with another breathwork exercise, something I did a few months back and some of you have requested for another and I know I could use it today. So wherever you are, go ahead and close your eyes unless you're driving if you're driving just follow along with your breath and if you're not driving close those eyes and start to envision a place that makes you very very happy my place is hawaii right there on the beach with a crystal cave behind me in case anybody needs some inspiration totally serene no one else on my beach where I go to in my head. And then take a deep breath in through the nose. Hold it at the top. And exhale, audible release. <sighs> so let's do that a couple more times. With your happy place right there in your third eye. Envisioning it, seeing it, feeling what it feels like, listening to what it sounds like. Deep breath in through the nose. Hold it at the top and exhale. <sighs> we'll do that a couple more times on our own cycle of breath. Breathing in through the nose. Holding it at the top. And releasing when you're ready. And as you continue to breathe, I will tell you what I've been up to lately before I tell you about our guest, the beautiful Jasmine Helmsley. So continuing to breathe, continuing to focus. And I don't care if you guys are sitting at your desk at work, you can calmly breathe, tap into yourself, get present. Anywhere you are makes a huge shift in your attitude, in your mood, in your central nervous system, in everything that you do. It even shifts the brain. So pretty, pretty beautiful. I know that we don't all take the time to incorporate breathing, meditation, journaling into our day. I know that I often don't either, but when I do, it makes a huge difference in the kind of day that I have. So what I've been up to ever since, ah, my life has just been a whirlwind since getting diagnosed with chronic Lyme a couple weeks ago and toxic mold poisoning, mast cell activation syndrome, which is often called MCAS, a gene mutation that basically just makes me get super sick anytime I could possibly be exposed to mold or to toxins of any kind or to Lyme. So that's why I've been extra knocked down with being so sick. So my life has been a lot of doctor's appointments and getting used to my new routine. I was supposed to be in Hawaii this week with my family and I ended up having to cancel that trip, sadly, so that I could be here to get my treatments. And I'm just lucky to have a family who completely understands and didn't give me a hard time at all because their priority is just me getting better and feeling better. I wish I could report that I was starting to feel better. I'm looking at just like my 25 different medications that have taken over my usual podcasting station, which is why we now have been podcasting from the couch, which is actually awesome. Um, but I haven't been feeling any better at all. Sadly, I've been feeling worse, which is known as the Herxheimer reaction often which is the toxin die off and all sorts of things happening in the body. So soon when I have the energy, I'll be recording a solo episode on my diagnosis journey and everything in between. So if you have questions, go ahead and leave them on my Instagram. The easiest would be the TBB podcast Instagram comment section. So commenting on recent photos, ask me your questions. I will include them. 
in the solo episode. As far as other things that are new, I started a high vibe chronic Lyme and chronic illness Facebook group. And the reason why I did is because I thought that there should be a high vibrational place for those of us to go speak about the things that we're experiencing on these epic journeys. And I call them epic because that's what they are. Spirituality is heightened when we're sick. We have no choice but to prioritize self-care when we're sick. We have no choice but to cut toxic people out of our life because they just make us sicker. And we also get to experiment with all of the cool alternative and holistic type of things to heal on top of whatever we're working on with our doctors. If you happen to see a Western doctor, long story short, I do. I love her, but I love all the spiritual things I do. So love that new Facebook tribe, chronic illness, chronic Lyme. No, it's called the chronic Lyme and chronic illness. No, it's called the high vibe chronic Lyme and chronic illness Facebook group, which you can find in the show notes. And we also have our soul on fire podcast tribe on Facebook. And this week in the soul on fire podcast tribe, we're going to do a giveaway of both of our sponsors, which I'll talk about in the intro. For Sigmatic and Omax, the amazing fish oil supplement that I've been taking. So you'll want to join the Soul on Fire podcast tribe if you haven't already. So both those things will be in the show notes and you can also just search on Facebook if you're listening and you happen to have access to a computer right now, Soul on Fire podcast tribe, join and I will accept you and Lastly, in terms of updates, I've been loving reading through your ratings and reviews of the podcast. So thank you to everybody who has taken the time to do that. Um, If you don't know how to rate and review the podcast, but you're interested in doing so, which really helps me a lot, and you will get a free gift, my blogging tips and tricks document that I send to everybody who rates and reviews the podcast and sends me a screenshot to jordanatthebalancedwand.com. So if you don't know how to do that, you can go to the TBB podcast Instagram. I have an Insta story highlight called rate and review, which you can click on. It teaches you how to rate and review a podcast. So it really helps us podcasters with all sorts of things. And I, of course, love getting to read what you say. And it makes me feel like I'm getting to know you, which is what this podcast is all about. It's about our community. So thank you if you take the time out of your busy and precious schedule to do such a thing for me. I would be honored. And before we dive into the episode with the amazing Jasmine Helmsley and she, you guys, just to give you a brief rundown, she's an Ayurvedic expert. She's a wellness and nutrition expert. She's a former model, former model. She is absolutely drop dead gorgeous. She's a self-care queen. She is British. So we get to enjoy her lovely, beautiful accent. And she has her own cafe, Helmsley and Helmsley. Helmsley with her sister in the UK in right outside of London or right in London. So if anybody's listening who lives in the UK, you guys are in luck because you get to go try it out, Helmsley and Helmsley. And she also has her book coming out in the US in September. It's called East by West. It came out last year in the UK. I have a beautiful copy sitting here and It's gorgeous. Lots of Ayurvedic recipes, Ayurvedic tips and tools. And we know I love Ayurveda. I'm doing another Panchakarma in a couple weeks. Panchakarma is kind of the one thing that reduces my inflammation and makes me feel really good. Ayurveda has changed my life and you guys will just absolutely fall in love with Jasmine if you haven't already, if you don't already know who she is. So excited for you to hear. Before we dive into the episode, I will tell you about our first sponsor, the amazing Four Sigmatic. So I've been using Four Sigmatic more lately than ever. And that's because I have completely 100% cut coffee out of my life 
sadly, but it really heightens my inflammation. And I also learned that I'm allergic to it. So I've been having all of the Four Sigmatic. What I use every single day is Four Sigmatic caffeine-free chaga, which I mix with my homemade almond milk, a little bit of hot water, a little bit of pumpkin pie spice and cinnamon. And occasionally I'll put in some carob powder, used to be cacao powder, but I've cut that out too for inflammation reasons. So yeah, the caffeine-free chaga, you will want to get your hands on it. It's incredible. You can use the code BLONDE at checkout at foursigmatic.com or you can go to foursigmatic.com slash blonde to get that 15% off. It's a really incredible discount. My tip would be to order a bunch of different things to try just because it's incredible. So I love the caffeine-free chaga. I also love the mushroom hot cacao. They use ginger in there and it tastes like a delicious warm cup of hot chocolate in your mouth. It's incredible. And if you are a coffee person, You can absolutely get their mushroom coffee or their mushroom mocha. I have a lot of friends who are super into that as well. And I used to be too when I could have coffee. They also have lots of new things like a charcoal lemonade. And charcoal has been one of my absolute lifesavers and game changers in my healing journey because it just completely detoxes the body, binds to toxins. If you have mold or parasites or anything toxic dying off in your body, you want to incorporate charcoal into your routine to bind bind itself right to it and take it out of your body. So Four Sigmatic has a wide, wide, wide array of different things that you'll want to try. They even sell a frother on their website. And soon I will have a special The Balanced Wand landing page, which I'm crazy excited about. But for now, you can go to foursigmatic.com slash blonde to get those 15% off. And if you want to learn more about the magical mushroom kingdom, listen to the episode that I did with Taro, the founder of Four Sigmatic. And secondly, I have another amazing deal for you guys. And you've probably seen them lately on my Instagram story because I talk about them every day along with Four Sigmatic. This is Omax 3 Ultra Pure, the incredibly pure, actually the most pure on the whole entire market, fish oil supplement company. And to get a free box, yes, they are offering a free box of these fish oil supplements. If you go to tryomax.com slash blonde, where you will get a free box along with anything else that you choose to order on their website. So think about it as like a buy one, get one free type of thing, but you get a free box of fish oil supplements. And something that you probably don't know about fish oil is that over 75% of Americans don't get enough omega-3s in their diet. And because that is three-fourths of people. (laughs) You're probably one of them. So let me tell you why omega-3s are so important to your health. Number one is that they alleviate joint pain and muscle soreness. So I've been really sore ever since I got diagnosed because I'm on all these crazy different medications that don't make me feel very good. And I can definitely say that this has been alleviating some of my pain and has helped me feel a lot better. Number two is that they also improve focus and memory, boost cardiovascular health, and so much more. So you're probably wondering what makes them different from other supplements on the market. Like, why are you talking about them, Jordan? Why have you chosen them? Well, I always do my homework for you guys so that you don't have to. Number one is that you've probably seen some of these fish oil supplements at the store, but many top sellers don't contain enough omega-3s to give you the actual results. And Omax 3 Ultra Pure has almost 94% pure omega-3 fatty acids. It's the purest concentration on the whole entire market. They have a patented ratio that is specifically engineered for inflammation and joint pain. So I know you guys will love them. Go to tryomax.com slash blonde today to get a box of Omax 3 Ultra Pure for free 
with a purchase. So that's trialmax.com slash blonde to get your free box along with whatever else you purchase on their site. Terms and conditions to apply. And it comes with a 60-day money-back guarantee. So you have plenty of time to try it and feel the difference. So with that long-winded intro with lots and lots of good deals for you and some of my current favorite brands, I am very happy to introduce Jasmine Helmsley. Mwah. Enjoy. All right, guys, I am here with the beautiful Jasmine Hemsley. She is visiting from the UK and she's been kind enough to sit here on the couch while I meddle with this whole entire system, (laughs) trying to be some kind of tech savvy podcaster, which is just never going to happen, but we made it work. We made it work. Well, I I did nothing. I sat on the couch, which is very comfy. I played with Hudson and um, feeling very chilled out, feeling very LA. It's lovely day outside. I can see Bougainvillea. I know. Isn't it beautiful? Big picture window. It's gorgeous. I'm going to miss this window. Mm. I'm moving so soon and I'm going to miss this view and Hudson's going to miss basking in the sun (laughs) that completely (gasps) covers. Oh my gosh. Someone's the vacuum hoovering. outside. <laughs> We're just going to go with it. Yeah. Um, That's so, life. So, yes. So, Jasmine, you are so many things. So, yeah. I was stalking you this morning. <laughs> it was the first thing on my to-do list when I woke up because we haven't had the pleasure of meeting until today. But whenever Shaman Durek recommends someone for the podcast, I just say yes, just without even checking into it because he has the kindest most inspirational and just all around expert friends and people in his life and that is you so thank you i i I owe to him as well and did we mention his amazing hugs that man oh gives amazing hugs i need one of those right about now so I did happen to know some things about you and now I know a lot more and you're an Ayurvedic practitioner among so many other things. You have a restaurant I have in the a, UK. I have a, yeah, we call it call it a cafe and I said it was 40 seater the other day. They'd be like, that's properly a restaurant. Practitioner, I wouldn't say practitioner. Okay, you're an Ayurvedic I would say author. I'm an Ayurvedic author. I would say a bridge more than anything. I really oh. just want to be a bridge between the kind of Western world and how we view health and these ancient Eastern philosophies, which is why my book is called East by West, because I'm yeah. fascinated by both. And I definitely came from a, a huge interest in the Western functional medicine side of things. And over the years that I've been interested in health, Ayurveda just kept popping up. <laughs> and I kept Ayurveda trying to ignore it. And it kept magic. on answering questions. Yeah. Yeah. So you also seem like you have a background in fashion. Mm -hmm. I modeled for 15 years, probably full time and also design. So I studied furniture and product design. I was really into my art when I was younger. So as my mum says, I'm a jack of all trades, master of none. And I think actually that was like what she said when I was younger, but I, I think I like it that way. You know, I really can become very focused on one thing. And I think what my life's journey has taught me so far is, you know, a bit of everything makes a good broth. I think so too. So that brings me to what is your zodiac sign? I'm an Aquarius. Oh, are you? I am. And do you know your rising and your moon? I don't know which one is which, but I know that 50% of my bits and pieces to do with that are in Virgo and 50% are in Aquarius. So I'm in a massively pulled, you know, complete opposites. My Aquarian head is like, I can take on the world, big picture, wacky ideas, don't give a about what anyone thinks. And then my Virgo side is like detail, precision, perfection, Earth. um, earth. Yeah. Everything, everything I didn't really think I was because I'm not particularly neat. I'm not organized. I'm not early. I was on time today. Actually, that was that was what I call early. Yeah, um, same. I was like, she's early. <laughs> she's on time. On time is early. Mm-hmm. Um, and 
So yeah, I've really kind of, I've, I've, I love going to astrology readings. It's one of those things that I have stopped myself learning too much about because it'll be another thing that I'll kind of want to get in. But I love the readings. I mean, I love them. And um, yeah, recently I did a a Kabbalah one, uh, a friend recommended. So I've done Yotish, which is the Ayurvedic quite a few times. I've done a Kabbalah one twice and I've done a few Western ones. And what is so incredible, and actually this leads really nicely to Ayurveda, is that they're all looking at these different charts. They're all, you know, they have different ways of measuring the sky, uh, different calendar years. And yet they are so, they all agree on where what it is that's informing me, you know, which for the Ayurveda, you know, the Ayurveda is the knowledge of life or the science of life. That's the direct translation. And, um, you know, it comes from India. It's 5,000 years old and it's quite similar to, I can never say this word, <laughs> traditional Chinese medicine. So TCM. Yeah, that's a mouthful. And then there's got Nepalese medicine and Tibetan medicine and all these other kind of ideas of health around the world. And they're just different languages for the same thing. That's that's how I see it. In the same way, you can have that Kabbalah reading, the Yotish reading and the I Western think so reading. too. Yeah, I love that. The reason why I asked is because I'm also a jack of all trades, master of none. And my friend who is incredible with astrology was looking at my chart just a couple weekends ago and she saw that my Gemini is in oh gosh no my something about my Mercury is Mm -hmm. Gemini or whatever it was Mm -hmm. that she saw said a lot about how I'm so interested in everything Mm -hmm. but I will learn and learn and learn and learn about it and then then I will completely move move on which is what I have done over oh my gosh well the course of the last five years for yeah. sure, but just all the time, like so into specific things. Yes. And I think that's beautiful. Mm-hmm. I think there's a place for those of us who don't choose to be an expert in a mm-hmm. certain field, mm-hmm. but rather or a practitioner, mm-hmm. because you mm-hmm. just said that you're not necessarily that, mm-hmm. but you have the passion, you have the knowledge, you have the specific gift of being able to bring Ayurveda to people and other things in a new and fresh and modern kind of way. So I love that. Well, I think as well, we, we need people like that who are willing to ever evolve and be open and be able to say that was then and this is now and this is where I'm at, but that's this is not the final chapter it goes on and on and on. And the only constant in life is change. And so that's that saying has really helped me so many times because when I am really and I want to lock on to something as truth, you know, I want to lock on and it be um, absolutely solid as a rock. And I realize nothing is. You can't rely on anyone else or anything or any material thing. We have to be fluid with that stuff. Yeah. But also interestingly... What you've also just described, it, Ayurveda would call a vata energy. Yep. Which is, I think, you and also definitely yeah. me. Well, I am quite pitta, mm-hmm. um, especially if you had seen me a few months ago oh, with yeah. the inflammation and, yeah. oh God, just complete heat everywhere, everywhere in my body. And I've always resonated with both, mm-hmm. with being pitta vata. Um, I'm vata pitta. Yeah, because I think my natural constitution is mm-hmm, pitta, mm-hmm. but I'm such a vata energy. Yes. So living in Los Angeles and just kind of having this fast paced life, which I've taught yes. myself to slow down, has been quite the contrast mm. and has caused a lot of a lot of different imbalances. Mm-hmm. So for everyone listening who doesn't know about the doshas, tell us, tell us what they are. So the doshas are these three energies and it's, I think most people that go into Ayurveda or hear about Ayurveda, it's the first thing that they kind of hear about, I think, especially if you've done yoga training. Mm -hmm. So these three energies are really a kind of subcategory for the five elements. The five elements being space, nothing exists without being in a space, air that we can think of as the sky, but it's in it, in everything, in our bodies. Fire, we can think of that as the sun, but you can also think about it as a metabolic uh, reaction in every cell in the body. Um, you could, or even the core of the earth. Um, you could think, then have uh, water, 
of course, water is our body, 80, 90% water, um, the sea, the clouds, you know, the moisture, the rain, um, and then earth. Earth is that wonderful grounding solid energy. So those five elements are then put into the three doshas. So the doshas I like to think of as descriptives. They're like red, yellow, and blue, the, the primary colors. And then everything in this room right now is some kind of division of red, yellow, and blue, but really it's the full color spectrum, i.e. the elements. So um, when we talk about, you know, where we see these colors, these descriptives, you know, you can you can apply it to everything. So the we can talk about this this table is very kapha you know it's it's cool it's solid it's heavy it's low to the ground mm -hmm. but then you can compare it to another table that was even more solid maybe it's made of marble which is even cooler and maybe it's even lower to the ground and then you could say that lower table is more kapha than this table so you can say you can see how it's about different ra ratios um, within everything so all three doshas are within us you tend to be one, maybe one or two, and rarely all three, like my other half, from birth, which is your genetic nature. And then if you, when you grow, you go through different doshic influences through the time of your life, periods of your life, but also the seasons, but then also environmental changes. So for example, as someone quite vata predominantly, I am actually sitting here in a, in a hoodie in LA. <laughs> yes. Um, I would rather be warm all the time, but generally because it's a, I'm in a hot country and I've just been in Arizona in the desert, uh, my pitta has been the one that I've been looking after because I was giving talks and, and pitta is this more type A kind of hot leader type um, energy. So I was being very pitta there, um, but previous to that, I was feeling very vata because I was, I was nervous. So how do we describe this? I normally do this with a, with a kind of PowerPoint presentation because it's much easier visually to understand when it's such a different concept we're talking about. But um, in general, vata energy is space and air. So it's light, cold, dry, quick, rough. So think of the wind and autumn leaves blowing in the wind. You know, it's the kind of energy when it's around where you can get caught up in it and you'll be in a whirlwind, chatty, da 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 da, ideas, fast moving, and you'll get dry lips and you'll get windblown hair and your ears will get cold. And that evening you'll have to just sit in front of the fire or in a hot bath and just start to balance it out. So like increases like. So as a very Vata person, even though I'm Vata Pitta, in London, which is cold, light, rough, not always dry, it rains a lot, but a very fast stimulating energy. It's very creative, just like Vata. There's lots of screens, there's lots of technology, there's lots of bright lights. I can ve get very Vata deranged, if you like, because mm. like increases like. So that means as much as I'm attracted to spin classes and aerobics and loud noises and and I'm the kind of person who, if you put me in front of a TV or a magazine, I wouldn't hear you because I just want information. So then I, what I have to do is do lots of grounding exercises. Meditation has been an incredible um, technique for me. I, ha I usually travel with a beanie and a scarf in the UK, except on the really hot days because on the tube, you get a lot of cold breezes. Um, I fly certainly with my hat on and my scarf on and turn that blower off straight away. And I oil my nose and keep my kidneys warm and I have socks, woolly socks. So I've learned all these techniques to keep me balanced. Even if it doesn't at the time feel like it's the right thing, but in time it's become a more intuitive thing to remain in balance and not get caught up in the hype of things. Yeah. I like that you say that because I'm definitely someone who can, in the moment, oh, it's not that big of a deal mm -hmm. if I'm really cold or not that big of a deal if I'm in the sun getting sunburned. Yeah. But later yes. it becomes a big deal and everything adds up. Yeah. So because everything adds up, it's important to take those precautionary measures mm -hmm. and you've probably had to put your vata aside to do that because... I know us Vata people are like, oh, whatever. I'm whatever. just going to live in yeah, the moment. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, that's yeah. good. It's a little thing. So while I was away in, in Arizona, I gave a talk about iced water and said, wow, this is, sorry, America. This is very American, but it's, 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 it's so cold 
and it's so extreme. And even though we're in the desert and we're mostly hot, it's a killer for digestion. And everyone changed immediately. And I got such great feedback. So there are, I'll go into more about the doses in a minute, but it's, these are kind of specific things. So if you're listening to them and thinking, oh God, this sounds so complicated. This is just almost another level that you can take things to. And we'll talk about the more universal principles in a minute, if you like. Um, so Vata, yeah, cold, rough, dry, fast, creative, very spiritual, very kooky, very wacky, into everything, Me. into everything. And then can't remember what that was about. Always 100%. late, 100%, always late, always wanting to do one more extra thing before they have to be somewhere. Always want to talk to everybody, just want to absorb all this information. So too much of that lifestyle can push you over the edge into this vata deranged state and then you are prone to being wired and anxious and a knotted stomach when it comes to eating food and you start pecking at things because you're never truly hungry and you're never truly full your skin feels dry you you know you you suck up oil in the body what else sleeping becomes a problem you can become very very light sleeper lots of dreams lots of those wacky adrenalized states between 2 and 4 a.m everything can just become too much and then you literally crash and you'll start to feel those chills in the body and uh, yeah. So, that so is my life. Vatas get tipped very quickly and that energy actually affects everybody, even if you're very kapha. So a kapha type person is earth and water. So they're grounded, they're cool. They are the epitome of chilled out or horizontal on the sofa. They're just mm. laid back. It's water off a duck's back because they have that earthy mother earth quality. But when they appear in the city where people are like, I want this yesterday and watch this, watch this video and check this out and read this information and they're traveling on the tube and there's people around them, so much going on, they can get Vata deranged too. So this is the thing to remember is don't just learn about your dosha, your prominent dosha from birth, because we are ever changing every time, especially now when we travel so much, we're in different climates, we're exposed to different things, different ideas, and the world has become really fast. Technology is scarily everywhere. fast and everywhere. And the light, you know, even the light that we receive in our eyes, you know, we don't realize how abnormal this kind of blue light is in the evenings and the effects on the body. Of course, it's not going to knock you down straight right, away, right. but that's where we Over don't, time, yeah, we don't that's realize. That's freaking me out. Mm. I've been paying a lot of attention to that lately because I have been so light sensitive because of the Lyme mm -hmm. and everything else going on with my health. So I started noticing a couple months ago, screens at night, watching yeah. Netflix or mm -hmm. FaceTiming with Jonathan, which I yes. was doing constantly because yes. I was gone for two months. Yes. I couldn't do it at night. I was just like getting these horrible yeah. headaches and fog mm -hmm. in front of my eyes. Mm -hmm. And I just started thinking, this is so unnatural. Yeah. There's nothing natural about this. Nope. No, I, in fact, I was reading a lot about it last night. I have been a big, I talk about flux. Do you know flux? Yes. I, I've been oh, using that for like. I stopped using year. it like an I've been idiot. using it for years and it's years amazing. and years. It is amazing. Like, it's free and right. it's basically saving your health. Yeah. So everyone listening, you guys should check it out. It's F dot lux, right? Exactly. My uh, functional medicine doctor recommended it back when I was having insomnia, which I still have, but mm -hmm. was seeing him for, mm -hmm. and it helped a lot. I'm telling you, if there's one thing you do, you pop, you pop that on, you, you use your phone or your Android, your iPhone or your Android, and you set it to the sunset mm -hmm. mode. And I mean, you could just to put it to the direct sunset mode where it knows the time that the sun sets in the country you're in. But to be honest, from five o'clock, I make mine go orange, even if the sun's not going to set till 9 p.m. Because I don't want to be on my laptop past five or six o'clock. Yeah, that's a really good mm. way to now, give yourself a self-care reminder. To I'm just in a turn taxi, you know, going home in the dark from an event with with a friend and they suddenly turn on their phone or answer and I just see this blue blue light and I literally go like a vampire. Ah! Oh, me too. I'm like, no, <laughs> no. I do that. I do that to Jonathan because what he does is if he's helping me with something mm -hmm. at night. Um, yeah, if you're editing and pictures, really it's late, difficult. And yeah. he'll be like, oh, let me help you. 
because I have all these issues lately with mm-hmm. this new computer, like mm-hmm. I told you. So he comes home. He tries to help me. He puts the brightness up from zero to yes. 100. Oh. And I'm like, don't, don't. You're going to actually break my eyesight. Yes. It's horrible. Worse than your eyesight, it goes into the cells. The I mean, it literally, you know, every cell in your body is like a clock and you're you're resetting it artificially and the knock-on effect of that is huge it will it will affect i mean just as a base level you can talk about melatonin production it it will cease being produced because it thinks it's daytime again then your whole body which is geared to survival will say oh, Jordan needs me. We're back in action. We've got stuff to do, you know, because it doesn't understand that an email is any different from running from a tiger. So it it launches the body back in. You know, the body will always try and be in balance. It will always try and support knowing, thinking that this time is critical and soon will come a time when you rest. But obviously we're on our emails 24-7, 365 days a year. So we don't actually ever rest and therefore the balance never comes. This is something we have to be aware of more so than ever is that that Vata energy affects every single um, other dosha being Pitta and Kapha. So I briefly talked about Pitta. Pitta is that type A leadership. Um, it's uh, it's fire and water. It's thick, hot, spreading, liquid, oily, sharp, sour. It's, it's a lemon, if you like, or some chili oil. That's what I talk about. So whereas Vata is kale, and um, a cracker, dry, rough. Pitta is a lemon and some chili oil, sour and spicy. You know, they are the people that like things done like that. They are very active. They're very competitive leaders. And they will, when they have too much heat, sourness, uh, competitiveness, they can become very judgmental, hot under the collar, frustrated. And that can manifest as rashes, heat in the body, sweating, not liking kind of the sun on them. So that's that one. And is there a place that you recommend people go to to learn their dosha? So I have on my website a uh, really easy uh, dosha test. So this is testing really your prakriti or your genetic nature. I mean, it's not an accurate test, but you don't need to be accurate. You just need to kind of... intuitive. It's intuitive. So I wouldn't spend too long answering the questions. Um, and also, so do you, want to, you answer it as if what's been true for most of your life. So for example, if you have never enjoyed eating spicy food and lately you've gotten into it, you just write, I don't like spicy food. I like that You can tip. do something else later to talk, work out what you, where you're at now. But it's nice to know where you came from. Yeah. But as all my Ayurvedic doctors and practitioners say to me, don't get fixated on it. It's not the blood type diet. It's not set in stone. I mean, the West, we love pigeonholes. We love labels. We love rules. This is just an idea so that when you are going about your daily business, you're like, you know, we do it naturally. Right now I'm getting quite hot. So I'm going to move my jumper almost subconsciously and, um, and then I'll start to cool off. And then in a bit, I'll kind of need it again and it will come back on. And it's that kind of day-to-day conversation with your mind, body and spirit that you can then remedy to keep that lovely balance. And it's not about being perfectly balanced all the time. Otherwise, life wouldn't be fun. But it's about going, when I've had two nights out in a row, extremely like fun events, talking nonstop, barely any sleep, I need to factor in some grounding time. Yes. So important. That's been a huge part of my life lately because I just don't have the energy that I'm used to. Mm -hmm because of being so sick. So I have to conserve, conserve, conserve. And then I do have the energy to do the things that really matter, keep the podcast going. Mm -hmm. But without that balance, Mm -hmm. it's not possible. And it's really And I think what you're doing is you're really teaching people what balance looks like, because our priorities have gone so askew in life as to what, you know, success is money and success is status. And I think we're, we are seeing this, not only a 360 approach coming back in, but we're going full circle. So all the things that we thought were primitive, backwards, waste of time, you think about that 90s attitude of go, 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 step on anyone to get there, sleep when you're dead, you know, health doesn't matter, you can fix it when you can buy medicine. And now we're going, actually, gosh, you know, there are so many of us we're very privileged to live in a time and a place where we have money for vacations, money for clothes, money to eat. 
and we're not very well. So we're suddenly reassessing. I mean, there's nothing like illness to put you on the knife edge to assess well, actually what's important in my life. What What is my point? What is my dharma? Where am I going with all this? And I think, you know, so many people say getting ill was probably the best thing they ever did because yeah. there is nothing like learning a life's lesson from the dose that the universe wants to give it to you. Oh, yeah. I already feel that way. I feel like it's been my greatest gift and it's been the hardest thing yeah. in every single way. But it's quickly shown me what's important. And instead of doing everything, I've just been doing work-wise just mm -hmm. enough to get by. Mm -hmm. And I realized that makes me a lot happier yeah. than what I formerly saw as success is doing everything, mm -hmm. saying yes to everything, making the most money. Mm -hmm. And I actually feel just so much happier mm. doing less, making less. It's, mm -hmm. it's very interesting. It is. But it's the season of life, like you said, mm -hmm. and I'm happy to ride, ride mm -hmm. the wave. And I know that it won't always be this season. Mm -hmm. So I'm just taking it for what mm -hmm. it is, mm -hmm. which I love. I think it was... I don't want to misquote the Dalai Lama. I think it was him who said something about what puzzles you the most about man is that they spend all of their health getting wealthy and then all of their wealth trying to get healthy. Oh my gosh. Such a, such a powerful, um, That is it? pretty much my life right now. Mm. Um, yeah, I love him. I love mm. following him on Twitter. I got to double check it is him, but I um, think it no, is him. I, I mean, I just, was, like him. I was just blown away by that quote we, because we my goodness, check. isn't it just it's amazing. puts things into perspective. Yeah. So I want to hear about your journey mm -hmm. and how did you get involved with Ayurveda mm -hmm. and then to your cafe? I just want to hear the whole ride oh. of your life. Well, okay. So I was born an Aquarian. Uh, elder sister of two, my sister Melissa is about five and a half years younger than me. My mother is Filipino. My dad is English and he was in the army. No wonder He's you're this now. beautiful oh, blend. Thank you of, so much. Yeah, oh, it's just a California tan. Um, <laughs> and they brought me up, you know, we had quite a a frugal upbringing in some ways, you know, Filipino mom, we, were, we ate everything on our plates. Everything was home cooked. There wasn't any talk about it. Whole foods are better for you than junk food. It's more like that's all mum and dad knew. That's how they'd grown up and that's what they fed us. And at the time, you know, it was different, I think, than maybe America. Eating out and eating ready meals was way more expensive than eating at home. So I was quite lucky to have that kind of good family style um, upbringing around food. Um, my dad was like a waste not, want not. You know, he would, if there was a moldy apple, he'd find one bit that was worth eating. Um, Sounds like my dad. Yeah. And uh, so we, I grew up, I learned to cook, at, I started cooking at nine years old because I remember my mum got some, some kind of project at work meant she was taken away for a few, for a few Saturdays. I can't remember if that was a month or two months or six months, but basically my dad would go out, get pork pies, get the paper. He'd read the paper and feed us pork pies. And after two Saturdays of this, I was like, hmm, I'm going to cook. And my mum said she used to come back to a complete mess in the kitchen. She said I was trying to make rice with red wine vinegar, which is weird because I don't think I would have known what a risotto was, but maybe I had been watching some kind of TV chef on, on telly. Or just your intuition. Or just my intuition. So very vinegary rice. Um, <laughs> my dad was so good. He ate everything. Aww. My sister on the other hand cried her eyes out. That's um, so funny. So that was, that was quite funny. And then I guess with the Filipino... Mum, you have a lot of aunties, not all related, but they were all your aunties. And so there would be lots of communal cooking. So I would be in there chopping onions just because I'd be dragged into the kitchen. So it, was, it wasn't it was a romantic kind of cooking way that people might imagine. It was just more practical, got to get food on the table. I guess I started to model and I'd always gotten away with being quite slim. But I started to see a pattern between what I ate and my energy levels and my mood and my outlook and my skin and having, you know, being a bit bloated, just little minor ones. And I was interested because, you know, this was the nineties and it was all about burn calories, go to the gym, neither of which I was very interested in. 
I didn't understand that calorific concept and now I'm glad I didn't buy into it. Um, I didn't understand why we ate and then had to burn it at the gym. It didn't make sense. And so I would then start reading about um, veganism and, and paleo types of eating, why meat's good, why meat's bad, why raw's good, why raw's bad, why, um, why you need fats, why you don't need fats. And everything was so contradictory. And Ayurveda kept popping up. That's probably the first time. Then I got into yoga in my 20s and it came up again. Then when I was 25, I think I got a parasite in, in South Africa. So that led me on a whole other uh, journey of acid reflux and constipation that I had to deal with. And then late 20s, I remember thinking, why when I eat late, am I starving when I wake up? That does not make sense from a Western calorie in calorie out point of view. And then I have eight answered that one. And then when I was 30, I learned to meditate. I did Vedic meditation in Sydney with um, my good friend, Gary Goro. And from there, he started to drip feed me little bits of Ayurvedic wisdom. That some things, you know, I remember saying to him one day, Gary, I found this raw, organic milk, unpasteurized, unhomogenized. It's delicious. Da, 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 da. And he just said, oh, in Ayurveda, we cook our milk. And I remember thinking, no, Gary, I've just found raw milk. Why would I cook it? Why would I do that? And it didn't really dawn on me until quite a few years later. But he would just plant these little seeds. And so my Ayurvedic journey has been very uh, gentle and continual for, I'd say, about 15 years. And, um, and it all really came together uh, two years ago when I went on my first Panchakarma, which um, means five actions. And it's a, it's, um, a, a retreat or a, a therapy, if you like, where Ayurvedic herbs, remedies, treatments, massages are used every day to kind of speed up the healing process or to detoxify the body. And that's when I was like, wow, there are so many things blowing my mind right now that are the opposite of what functional medicine says. I need to open up my mind and just really see what this is about. And I think Ayurveda has, you know, it's this 5,000 year old tried and tested way of living. And nutrition science is about 170 years old, you know. So while I'm enjoying all of this, these breakthroughs um, and all this new information, I also know that they're going to they're going to slot into their own places eventually until they've built the knowledge of life again, which is Ayurveda. Yes, yes. Oh, that's so beautiful. Thank you. Ayurveda really is the key to understanding how we feel, Mm -hmm. which is huge. And just like you said, I think there's so much going on in medicine right now, especially alternative medicines Mm -hmm. that are just starting to put together all these things that Ayurveda already already holds. But I do love the approach of just letting people catch on Mm -hmm. as they do instead of shoving it down people's throats, which is hard not to do yes. when you feel like it could help. Yes. I mean, it's very difficult because if it's not, because this is a knowledge of life. And remember that, you know, in India, where this originated or in China, where they use traditional Chinese medicine in, in the rural areas, I think, you know, the allopathy or the Western medicine has probably surpassed it in many um, cities and things. But this is knowledge that children learn from birth. So it's very hard to take a Western mind and just throw them in the deep end. I mean, it's some things that you, you get straight away, makes sense. Other things are like, really? You know, for example, on that dosha test, it will ask you, um, are your lashes thick? And you're like, oh, please. <laughs> How has it got anything to do with right. it? But, but keep an open mind. It will, you will, you will soon see why. Because everything that you are thinking and everything that you are manifests through the body. You are a book. So it will come, I was saying to um, um, Shaman Direk, I did his podcast the other day. We just did a little, we just did a little, little quick one because that's basically our life. We see each other for a little, little bit I of know, time. That's so and we spend half of so it hugging. Him. I love that. And him. I said the same way, um, Direk, that you read my bones, you know, in Ayurveda, traditional Chinese medicine, they read you. They, you know, I've heard the story of traditional Chinese medicine where you walk down the corridor towards the doctor or practitioner. And by the time you arrive, he's got your number. He, he's sussed you out. He can tell everything, your face shape, the, the, the little symptoms that we might recognize like dark circles and rushes and things, but even the way you walk, the way you hold yourself, the energy you're giving out, they read it all. If you want something to blow your mind, I mean, in Ayurveda, they, they take your pulse and they read you from your pulse in the same way that we read someone from their stars. And 
you know, Ayurvedic practitioners, some of them were pulse reading for 30 years every day until the, before they could even practice. Can you imagine? That's why I could never call myself a practitioner. I'm just, yeah. I'm just a massive advocate. Yeah, you're an advocate. <laughs> it's pretty unbelievable. So Marta from Surya Spa mm -hmm. in the Palisades, yes. who I was telling you about, who has done several of my Panchakarmas and then Anjali did my first one. I love mm -hmm. her. And she's been on this podcast before, but Marta, oh my gosh, she, anyone who's seen her or met her can attest to just what a brilliant genius she is when it comes to knowing the body and healing. She's mm -hmm. a true healer. Mm -hmm. So holding my pulse, she... It's crazy with what she comes up yeah. with. She's like, oh, you're getting your period tomorrow. Yes, and you're feeling I a little foggy one. and yeah. you haven't been sleeping. And what's with the rash on your back? What's with but the bad I'm, dreams? But I I'm got... laying on my back and she yeah. can't see my back. She just knows uh, from the pulse. Isn't and, that incredible? I mean, yeah. she's, she's amazing. So she was the first person, one of the first people that I texted when I got diagnosed a couple mm -hmm. weeks ago, just to say, we finally know what it is, what's causing these rashes. When can I come in for a panchakarma? Because I just need deep detox right now. Mm -hmm. And yeah, she's amazing. It's incredible. I mean, I'm, I'm careful about who I talk about the pulse reading to because it will weird people out who are not ready for it. You know, my, when I arrived in India to do my first panchakarma, he took my pot. I mean, we were so jet lagged. And plus, you know, we were ready for this. We'd been, we'd been invest, uh, researching Panchakarma for four or five years um, before we went into this deep, deep one. They usually recommend you don't do it until you're 30, 40. These kind of long, big, you know, you're there every day. So we did our research and we went out there and the doctor took my pulse and said, your period's starting in two days. And I was like, um, yes. <laughs> and yeah. start to tell you all about you. And then, you, you know, I'm open-minded, but I'm also like, you know, you know, I think most people have got a bit of eczema. Most people have got a bit of indigestion. You know, you're, you're quite thinking about it. He proceeded to do it on Nick, my other half, and told him which of his vertebrae are out, like C2, C11. Da, da, da. Now, Nick knows because he's had an ongoing battle with his back post rugby issues when he was younger. So he's, he's, no, he's been going to physio on and off for years um, and has taken a great interest in all this. So he was kind of astounded but it wasn't until we went home and told the story and saw people's faces that from this pulse with no prior medical conversation no prior conversation we'd never met him before he told nick which of his vertebrae were damaged he told him about an injury in his right arm which had yep nick dislocated and he even said the age 14 years old really yeah so it blows but at the same time then you've got to go you know why did Mozart be able to write those pieces? Why has why was Einstein, who's just clerk, able to Einstein, Einstein mm -hmm. able to do that? Because they were able to tap into the knowledge that is all around us. That's what I believe. There, that knowledge, information, energy is basically what it is. Is everything? Yeah, I was gonna say, I was gonna say that because when it comes to reading a pulse, I think it becomes extremely intuitive. Mm -hmm. Like I have this pendulum right there. Mm -hmm. And I'll ask questions for about my life, my friends' lives, mm -hmm. when they have something going on. And occasionally, if I'm really tapped in, mm -hmm. which is not always, because mm -hmm. I don't consider myself a master of mm -hmm. anything at this point at all. Um, but if I am, and if I'm really connected to the person who I'm speaking to the pendulum for, the pendulum opens a channel to so much more. Yeah. So I've had experiences of asking about um, a certain friend, how should they eat? Because mm -hmm. they're having so many health issues mm -hmm. with their stomach. And I start to get some answers. And then I see this absolute pathway into mm -hmm. so much stuff. So I just tell them and yeah. And they're like, this is so accurate. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I feel like it's a portal. So yes. if you're using a pendulum or if you're reading pulses, mm -hmm. and of course it's much heightened when you mm -hmm. are extremely educated in the mm -hmm. field, like mm -hmm. people with Ayurveda. Mm -hmm. But it's energy. It's, it's all energy. energy and you're you're using something that says I am trusting in a wider energy, in a, in a wider knowledge. And so that's why there are those moments that you can tap in and you can get that knowledge. But imagine most of us are schooled in this is how you behave, this is right and wrong, this is black and white. This is yes and no. This is what you do when you're sick. This is how you cook your food. This is when you eat. This is how you brush your teeth. And so it's very hard when you're 
literally conditioned to see outside of the box. And that's why we have to be very careful. You know, people are finding you, they'll find your podcast when they're ready. You know, that's why one thing I've learned is never shove this shit this stuff Never. down people's throats, you know, because yeah, unless you're ready for yeah. quite a bit of backlash, yeah, and, and 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 all you'll do is you'll further you'll further kind of put them off, really. Yes, it's just like veganism and mm. all sorts of other things that mm-hmm. if you shove it down someone's throat, they get the most horrible impression of the whole entire movement and mm-hmm. community, mm-hmm. and it's just not what it's about. Absolutely, and it's so much just about everyone's different, and they're yeah. going to do what works for them when it works for them. exactly. And I think, I mean, I believe in many lifetimes. Mm -hmm. So I don't think it's everyone's lifetime to be into this kind of stuff. I couldn't agree more, Jordan. I really, you know, there was a time when my Vata Aquarius self wanted to save the world. And I have to remember that I'm not, I'm just little me. And I can work on myself in a, in a, in a lovely way, which is also a work in itself because you're always chastising yourself and just try and live and let live and learn what I'm supposed to learn. And then if I can, by example, um, share that with people that it might be useful for, because not probably not useful to most people, then that's kind of my work. And with, you know, my, my first two cookbooks were Hemsley and Hemsley. You know, this is like where I arrived um, or how I've been eating for the last 10, 15 years, 20 years, influenced by Ayurveda, but with a lot of that functional medicine, new nutrition advice attached to it. And it was really successful. I mean, you've got to, you've got to remember this is, this is England. We're not so much, we weren't so much on the food scene, let alone the health food scene. And that's all very much changed. And I'm really proud of all the work we've done. My cafes in Selfridges, I love it. I love that people are coming there they're wandering in and having a great meal and then they find out why it's healthy or they're, they're, they're traveling from afar because they've got the cookbook. So they've seen the TV show and they're arriving there. And then I felt this massive, massive pull to do Ayurveda. And I was thinking, oh, I don't want to go there. I don't want to. People hadn't even heard that word that I've spoken, you know, that, that I've spoken to. Why would I leave myself open to this? Or um, I don't know enough or, you know, all these things came up. And then I thought, do you know what? I'm into my meditation, I'm into yoga, which means I first heard about this, you know, 20 years ago. If I could just plant the seed and make the word more accessible and make it feel a bit friendlier, then someone who's not well now or or is not well in 10 years will suddenly go, oh, there's one more thing I haven't tried. Or there's this thing I've heard of. In the same way that, you know, (laughs) no one ate avocado in the UK, barely, apart from when the Mexican scene, you know, started. And now it's become like the, the ultimate thing, food, right? you know, exactly. So, but, but what I see, you know, journalists say to me, um, do you get annoyed by the fads and the trends? And I like, yes, when they become extreme, but no, because they are just basically, it's almost like another chapter in the curriculum of Ayurveda, you know? So you have to have some massive hype around, you know, interesting ways to eat your vegetables or coconut oil or ghee or, um, or what can we talk about? Fermented foods. We have to have that hype about them because we're trying to make them accessible to everybody and reach more people. So for Ayurveda, which is really the mother of natural medicine, you could say, you know, fermented foods, intermittent fasting, uh, concoctions, tisanes, acupuncture, massage, tongue scraping, oil pulling, bliss balls, almond milk, everything that we know about Ayurveda, about, about health and wellness today is Ayurveda one aspect of it. Yeah. I, that's Meditation. So true. Yo- yoga comes from the same Vedic knowledge as Ayurveda. Right. And so where the yogi and the Ayurveda fits in is being a yogi is really living the knowledge of life. It's living Ayurveda. That's how the two have, uh, that's how the two relate. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. And you're so right. And I think it's one of those things where when you know about Ayurveda, you almost have to put your ego aside. Mm-hmm. Because you see people first experiencing tongue scraping and all these other things and you want to tell them, oh, if you like that, you're going to love all of this. Yeah. But some people just want to start with one thing or they don't even know where it came from and they don't care. So I found myself putting my ego aside a lot, which is healthy for us as, mm-hmm. as healthy human beings to do. So tell us more about your cafe. So my cafe is in Selfridges, which I think is 
what would it be like? Would it be like a Bloomingdale's or something like that? Mm-hmm. It's in it's in London. Um, central London on Oxford Street near Bond Street Station. It was 30 seats for two years and has suddenly become 40 seats, which is really fun. So it's growing. And in there you can get everything, you know, brilliant creations, uh, flax bread and quinoa toast and delicious soups and stews and just the whole spectrum, really. It really attracts fitness people. It really attracts people who want to be more aware of their food. You know, we the provenance of the food is excellent. We don't use any plastics. We don't cook with any plastics or any kind of um, non-stick lined pans that have any chemicals. We really consider about everything. And it's difficult because making money in food, you nearly really need to be selling volume of cheap food. So there's always challenges, but we try to be not not wasteful. Um, using, for example, we've now got um, a courgette pickle on the menu, um, a lovely little condiment, and it's made from the centre of the spiralised courgettes. So the little bit that gets left over, that's it. Um, that sounds delicious. Yeah. Oh, God, it really is delicious. It's my, fa- new, my favourite new recipe. Now that everybody knows about avocado, or, you know, not, not that we push that, but Ayurveda is the next level. Because it takes in, you know, the things we haven't been talking about, which is mental health, spiritual health and physical health. So we've been obsessed by physical health for the last 50, 60 years. We've been um, obsessed in the West by material wealth for 300 years. We've completely ignored the spiritual and mental aspect of everything. And now suddenly we're talking about both. And we've suddenly discovered the gut and the second brain and da 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 and it's so good and all the bacteria we need. And it kind of makes, it's amusing because Ayurveda has been talking about this for 5,000 years. So we are truly coming full circle. Yeah. We're about to see it all happen, all those things. And I speak to a lot of people from Indian, you know, families and they're like, oh my God, that's all the things I try to, to, to move away from because I want it to be more, more westernized. And mum was trying to give me this and my grandma was trying to give me turmeric lattes, golden milk. And uh, and they wanted to be more Western. And now they're going, right, and now, now we realised, yeah. Because they know how to use spices and herbs, nature's medicine cabinet in their food every day. So not just supplemental. Supplemental, you can, you can overdose. You could um, get the ratios wrong. You can not OD as in die, but, you know, too much of something, aggravate the body. The body needs to understand these things primarily as a food. And then it knows how to digest them and what to do with them. So I'm a big advocator. My book is full of recipes that are not Indian. Um, in fact, they're nothing like Indian food in many ways. They're not that, that hot chili flavors and everything's much more mildly spiced and herbed. Um, it's comfort food. But I also use it, for example, in I've got chestnut pancakes there with, with a, a chai um, stewed plum compote. So you can suddenly, I have in there black pepper and ginger and cinnamon and clove and nutmeg, but it's lovely and sweet. So spices are just as home with muffins, etc., as they are with more kind of curries, if you like. I cannot wait to try mm. the recipes in your beautiful book that we have right here. I saw some kind of like cinnamon roll type of thing. Yes, that a little teff pancake. Delicious. Yes. But yeah, what you were saying about spices, mm-hmm. when I first started seeing Anjali, my first dip into Ayurveda, and she was explaining to me certain things you can digest better if they're well spiced. Mm-hmm. I was thinking, how? How could that make such a large difference? And then once you start trying it, you see then you always have these anti-inflammatory spices and herbs in your mm-hmm. life mm-hmm. instead of, like you're saying, just supplemental. Exactly. So one lady said to me this weekend, just gone, when I do turmeric, I get this rash on my neck. And I said, what do you mean by do turmeric? She says, you know, right. like doing <laughs> cocaine or something. Exactly. She says, you know, I take these couple of supplements, pills of this, and I'm like, well, is that going on an empty stomach? And two things I'd love to cover on this podcast before I, before I get waylaid onto another subject, because that's what I'm like, mm-hmm. is the Vata. one, is that Vata, is the one, you can blame everything on Vata, by the way, everybody listening. It's like the dog ate my homework, it's that line. So this turmeric, you know, in a capsule, first of all, it's not a food because you didn't grow it, prepare it, smell it, taste it. You literally inserted it into your body and let it explode in your stomach. That's how I kind of think about those things. Does not sound very Doesn't sound nice, does it? I mean, there are so many things that, so many benefits to taking um, minerals and vitamins that way. 
it's a extremely convenient. Um, B, it looks after the contents. You know, those little pill uh, capsules take care of the contents inside, make sure they're not contaminated or they haven't, my brain's going deteriorated. But That connection to your food, I think, is a massive piece of the puzzle that's missing for us modern day urbanites. We do not grow our food. We are not involved in the the highs and lows of food production. We it, it doesn't take our sweat, blood, and tears to make this food. We don't don't you know pull it from the earth and appreciate every bite of that carrot because it took how long to grow. We don't you know we're so wasteful. And we just are disconnected from our food. We literally point and we make the choice of what we're pointing to based on the latest thing we've read or the latest influence. And then we chuck it into our bodies. So let's just take an ice cold smoothie here, chuck it into our bodies and drown our digestive fire. Right. So our Agni. So if anyone who's a yogi will have heard of Agni, the, the breath of fire, you know, that breath of fire you do to... <laughs> to kind of stimulate that area. Ayurveda believes that Agni or that fire is there to digest not just your food and get the best of it and leave the worst, but also life's experiences. So when my digestion is low or when I'm not taking care of myself and my fire is not lively, I could have a little upset with my mom or my my colleague or someone on the street, random person, and it would just play like a broken record all day, every day for about a week until I finished processing it. So we want efficient processing system in the body. We want our fire to be lively. And many of the things that we do in our modern lives dampen that fire. Or in some in some cases, they could over enliven that fire. So two examples would be when I eat raw food, it's not great for my vata. If it was raw food in a more soupy smoothie form, it's sometimes better because I don't swallow tons of air. I don't rush and by accident swallow chunks of celery that then just sits and ferments in my stomach. Um, but usually with a, a kind of soup or a chilled raw soup, it goes in too quickly because it's too easy to eat. And the whole thing then takes a lot of my energy to digest and I feel sluggish and exhausted. So for a Vata person, cold raw food is not your friend because it's not it's not digested. So it uses your energy to digest it and the outcome of energy is not so not so high. So soups and stews are extremely good for me. A cooked breakfast, a warm hot water, I never drink cold water unless I was super on fire. And that's what keeps my digestion nice and lively. I also learned a while back to stop snacking. Because I feel like when I was snacking, um, it's like your your digestive fire is like a pot of water and you're trying to bring it to the boil. And every snack that goes in is like adding another bit of cold water. So I was speaking to my friend about this last night who is intermittently fasting, but in the hours he's allowed to eat, he just continuously eats. And he said, he came to the conclusion that my digestion is not great. And I said, well, this is one of the reasons why you're just, you'd keep on putting logs on the fire and the fire doesn't get a chance to get a foothold. And I said, okay, that kind of makes sense. So one of the universal um, laws of Ayurveda is to take care of your digestion. Don't even bother really worrying about your doshas. They're just more the kind of when you're refining the art of it. But the main thing would be to look after your digestive digestion. So if you're angry, upset, frustrated, rushing, now is not the time to eat, for sure. Like take your time, be a bit of a Buddhist monk about it Mm -hmm. or be a geisha, I say, and just look at that food. And remember that food is going to hopefully become you. You don't want it putrefying and then coming out the other end. And then having a too lively fire, food will usually go straight through you and you'll be on the toilet maybe three or four times a day. So anyone having slightly wetter uh, and quite fiery poos, that's when there's too much heat in the body and you are annihilating everything if you, if you, if you like. So the nutrition is not being absorbed. Yeah. I love that. It's true. When I don't snack, mm-hmm. I feel so much better. You feel real wise. hunger. Right. Feeling real hunger is such an important piece of the puzzle. Mm-hmm. And I just did this two week water fast mm-hmm. a couple of weeks ago. I think we might've been we just, talking on We email. were contacting just at yeah, that time. Yeah. Um, yeah. And talk about Vata. I was oh. with my emails, a crazy person during the water fast. I was like, 
I'm water fasting. I can't answer anything like just a crazy person. Yeah. But it taught me when I introduced food, almost like introducing food again to a newborn baby, baby yeah. that not snacking was best for me. Mm-hmm. So I did that religiously for like a month and now I'm kind of back into my life and it's harder to stick to everything. Of course. But it's very important. Yeah. It's always a work in progress. You know, I have to balance out, you know, am I going to an event? What time are they going to eat? Shall I eat now? Or, you know, we have to look after our blood sugar levels. And this is, you know, for anyone who has blood sugar issues, please don't stop snacking if you're, whoever you're working with on this um, doesn't advise you to because, you know, that that could be troublesome too. There is no straight formula for those things. That's the thing. Everyone's different. Once you get knocked off the path, there are many other paths. And so depending on what path you ended up on, is the remedy for that. So as a general rule, I would say, you know, eat three meals a day, try to avoid snacking, be present when you're eating so that you're actually maximizing what you're absorbing and you're able to get rid of the stuff that doesn't suit you. So for example, anyone who might look at a dish and go, oh, that is a digestive nightmare. It would be so interesting how well you digested that if you went on a hike in nature and really just got present, felt yourself get hungry, felt your body ask for food, and then sat down and ate that digestive nightmare. And that's why people say, I could never eat that. But then when I'm on holiday, I ate it and I kind of felt fine, you know? When I was at my Panchakarma, I was with lots of, um, my first one in India, lots of Australians, Americans, and Brits who were all gluten intolerant or dairy allergies, etc. What are we eating? We're eating lassies made with, with yogurt, and fresh homemade chapatis, which are made with wheat. And everyone is absolutely fine on them. None of the symptoms they get in the UK. So, you know, Hippocrates said, all disease begins in the gut. Ayurveda says, um, disease comes from poor digestion. Because when you're, digestion, when you're not digesting it, it becomes toxicity in the body, ama. So, um, and the only way to get rid of that ama is to burn it out because it's so thick, cold and heavy. And remember, we need to use, look to the opposites to bring balance. And so um, Ayurveda said it's better to have good digestion and a bad diet than it is to have bad digestion and a good diet. Because otherwise you could be having all the best food on the planet, but if you're not able to, to, to digest it, it's a bit like putting, it's like, a bit like injecting it straight into your veins. Yeah, it's that not fun. speaks to me <laughs> as a very, very, very health conscious person with very poor digestion for all of my life. That totally speaks to mm-hmm. me because I can feel very, very good on something that's not sustainable, like a water fast mm-hmm. or a juice cleanse and then feel so sick when I'm eating these extremely healthy superfoods. Yes. Uh, just because of digestion. Yes. I guess when you're water fasting, you're really getting out of your body's way for a bit. And when you are running around, whether that's physically or mentally in your head, there's a lot going on and you start eating, your body can't understand why you're running from a tiger and having a taco. You know, it's really confused about where to put its energy. And it just, it, 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 it really, yeah, it really confuses the body. So my problem as well, especially with flying so much, is my digestion. I have to look after it very, very well. So one of the things I do is I usually carry fresh ginger in my bag um, or some ginger tea because if I know, this is a really good tip actually for Christmas or anytime you guys do Thanksgiving or anytime that you are at somebody else's house on somebody else's schedule, and they've put on a feast and you feel like breakfast was only one and a half hours ago um, and you're not hungry, but you know, it's not very social to just opt out. Then I prepare my digestion by nibbling on some ginger or a little bit of lime juice with some salt. And then within 10 to 15 minutes, my fire is ready. And one of the reasons that um, Anjali was saying about the herbs helping to digest food is because most herbs are pungent Therefore, they heat the body up. They get that body ready to digest the food. And then when they're cooked within the food, they also have that effect. So cooked food is actually crazy because in the West we would say, but there is so much more nutrition in three carrots, three raw carrots. And when we cook them, we lose 50% of the minerals and vitamins. But in that cooking process, we've made what's left much more uh, uh, bioavailable, much more soothing. I mean, even hot milk and cold milk are in Ayurveda two totally different kettles of fish. In the West, we go, it's the same product, but one's warm. In Ayurveda, it's like, 
Mm-hmm. Uh, Two entirely different things. To col- cold milk is clogging, mucus forming, heavy, dampening, difficult to digest. Milk that's been cooked for 15 minutes, we'll go back to my meditation teacher, Gary Goro, becomes lighter, warmer, more readily accepted. And if you start to then cook it with spices, like golden milk, suddenly you have this incredible tonic for the body. So it's it's interesting. And also Ayurveda puts sugar into perspective as well, which I think is really important because while I agree sugar has been a, a something very damaging to society, we can't go at it like we did with the whole fact campaign. You know, we went we 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 went anti fat and started to introduce all kinds of crazy things into our diet to to um replace it. Sugar has a place in the diet. Sugar is from an emotion point of view, it's a hug. It's it's also very grounding. It's why we celebrate with with sweet food. It's why we our mothers want to give sweet foods to us. And the sweet taste, as well as the other five tastes in Ayurveda, salty, sour, pungent, bitter, astringent, all of those play a role in us defining what it is we're supposed to eat. Because remember, 5,000 years ago, we didn't have a laboratory telling us and a, and, a, and a PR campaign about what we should eat. We only had our taste buds. So we could know if we ate too many green um, raw foods, our body were like, oh, that's quite bitter and astringent. I need something pungent and warming and salty and sweet now. So then your body knew what it was missing, which I think is, every time I read more about Ayurveda, blew my mind. <laughs> yeah, and... Ayurveda, I can thank for reintroducing dates into my life. Mm-hmm. The amazing dried fruit that I didn't have for so long because mm-hmm. I was so fearful of mm-hmm. the sugar. But it's, I mean, it's commonly used in Ayurveda yeah. cooking. And it's one so of they my would, favorite things. So the best way to have that, because that can be quite vata upsetting because it's been dried, even though the sugar is very vata soothing, is um, in Ayurveda, they will always soak their dry food, fruits. So so you'll, that's why you'll find soaked raisins in dishes and um, uh, so even the soaked almonds is so Ayurvedic. But the dates they would put with hot water and then within a porridge or you'd almost rehydrate it with hot water. Yeah, which makes it taste even better. Mm. It just releases the sugary yes, flavor. Absolutely. So keeping an eye on our time, because we could talk forever. (laughs) That'll be Um, round two. (laughs) Yes, round two for sure. I want to ask you a question that I ask everyone who comes on the podcast. Okay. If you were a color, what color do you feel best represents your energy? Not knowing much about colors and energy as a therapy or anything. My first inclination was yellow because I think that was my favorite color growing up, although it was Lelo back then. Yes, Lelo. And I'm also a fan of green and blue. I think blue makes me, green makes me happy. And usually wearing blue makes me feel really good. But actually, as you can see, I love all colors. You have all the colors I have all the colors of the rainbow on. You're very colorful. (laughs) And if you were a crystal, what crystal would you be? Okay, first thing that went in my head is amethyst, because that's my birthstone. And there right she here is. In front of us. Beautiful. Um, what would I be? That's your birthstone. That's my birthstone. So when's your birthday? Uh, February. I actually, do you know I play sound bowls? I play sound bowls. Yes, that's, that is a conversation I wanted <laughs> an, us to have. That's another and that's conversation. Be part two, so I, I love... have in my house, I have, we have, between my friend and I, we have 30 bowls. So I have maybe 10 to 20 in my house at any one time. What would I be? I think I'm probably going to stay with amethyst because it seems to be so, I guess I've got that in rose quartz. I'm not doing very well at answering these. I'm a yellow yes, amethyst are. so Beautiful. far. Beautiful. <laughs> so unique. And then final question for now mm-hmm. is who have been some people who have inspired you in the Ayurvedic world mm-hmm. or just people who you've learned from? Oh, too many to name. I think with Ayurveda, I was blown away. I produced this book in such a short time and it's one third bigger than it's supposed to be. And we cut 50% of it. So book two is sitting on my laptop somewhere. And I was just blown away by all the teachers and doctors who I thought would say, oh, who's this ex model girl with a cafe who thinks she knows about Ayurveda now? Honestly, they're, they're, I almost cried actually saying that. Their, um, their attitude is this is free knowledge. Everybody should have access to this knowledge. They went above and beyond to help me to read it, to check it. When I literally said to them, this is going to print, I've got four days. 
and they are busy people, as you can imagine, in health and wellness. So who can I think? Oh, gosh, so many. Gary Goro for even really kind of, he was my meditation teacher in Sydney. So although by then I'd already found, heard about Ayurveda, but he dropped a lot of seeds around me. Uh, Will Williams, another meditation teacher of mine in the UK, who really kind of pushed me along, like, come on, Jazz, what are you waiting for? The countless number of vijas in the back of this book, Dr. Matthew Shijo, especially, who is a um, an Indian Ayurvedic practitioner who lives in the UK now, was so helpful. I mean, he was probably the most helpful right at the end because he spotted two tiny mistakes. And I thought if he's gone to that level, you know, he really read the book and it's and I can't tell okay. you how, how safe that made me feel. Oh gosh, I'm on the spot now. And I'm, this is my Vata brain. I can't recall this stuff at all, but I've given thanks to them in the back of the book. And I would say to anybody who's interested, this is a, such a beautiful, romantic way of looking at life for all the ways we said that spiritual, mental, you know, those doshas affect all of us, are, are, are descriptive of everything that's going on. For me, it gives me this incredible framework and therefore tools to live my life. And I'm an urban girl. I don't live in an ashram. I don't grow for my own food. You know, there are so many ways in which I am depleted in modern society, but then I've got access to these tools like meditation, like mantras, like you know, a, a positive attitude to things about, you know, loosening up about being, trying to be in control of everything. And then when I can cook, then I can bring it, bring in my remedies through my cooking. So beautiful. And tell everyone where they can find you. So my name is Jasmine Hemsley and I'm on jasminehemsley.com. You can follow me at Jasmine Hemsley on um Instagram, Facebook and Twitter, but I'm not very active on Twitter. I live in London, but I'm always traveling I love to talk about this and I would love to hook anyone up into to experiencing more about Ayurveda. I have a resources page on my website. If you want to take your dosha test as a bit of fun, have a look at that. One caveat, do not become obsessed by what you are and do not wish you were a certain type because there are physical attributes to some of these types. So remembering that our Western mind thinks only, only thin is beautiful, you know, or that being a type A character is the way to be. Remember, these are just Western ideals. We are all, all beautiful, all unique, and we are all one as well. So it's that yeah. two things. We are all one. We are one. Well, thank you so much for being here. You're thank you so amazing. Much, Jordan. And I can't wait for part two. I can only hope that you'll be back in LA soon. And it sounds like you will be given your travel schedule is quite... Yep crazy and You're I do not always love super it far. here I love it here and my book comes out in September so I'm here? sure I'll pop out yes in okay. the US so I'm sure I'll pop back to do a bit more on that but thank you so much Jordan for having me thank it's been you. so lovely meeting you chatting with you and um, and being on the couch with you which is very calming to my Vata energy so thank you I love it I'm <laughs> doing everything on the couch these days and I'm glad that you couch therapy. like it yeah couch therapy couch and cat yeah, couch and cat therapy. And Hudson greeted you <laughs> he in the did. hallway. And now he's just teaching me what it is to be Zen right now. Seriously. All four of his limbs are like completely <laughs> on top of the other. <laughs> he's folded, he's, he's fluffy, folded. and he doesn't give a crap. <laughs> exactly. That should be the title of the episode. <laughs> thank oh, you. Thank you, Jordan. All right, guys, thanks so much for listening to the episode with Jasmine. She is full of knowledge, isn't she? About Ayurveda, self-care, spirituality, all of it. I loved talking to her. I loved meeting her. It was such an honor. So glad Shaman Durek introduced us. Thank you, Shaman Durek. And yeah, so I know I had a long-winded intro, so I'm going to keep the outro pretty short and sweet. But just to remind you, our sponsors for today's episode are the incredible Four Sigmatic and Omax 3 Ultra Pure Fish Oils. So you can go to the links in the show notes to get your discount of Four Sigmatic and your free box of Omax Pure Fish Oils. And otherwise, join the Facebook groups, Soul on Fire Podcast Tribe, Chronic Lyme and Chron Chronic Illness High Vibe Tribe, and rate and review the podcast if you feel up to it. And I will send you my blogging tips and tricks document. 
And otherwise, what I really care about is that you're having an amazing day, that you feel happy and balanced and in your body. And if you would like to go back to the beginning and listen to the breathwork episode, part of the episode, be my guest. I'm probably going to do the same thing. Love you guys so much. And I'll talk to you next week. Mwah.